So before we get started, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, believe me, when I picked this date, June 26th, for the speech two months ago, I did not order the weather to be 95 degrees. <laughs> so um, please bear, bear with me, okay? Uh, we have clouds rolling in, which is probably a good thing. The sun won't be beating on us. Uh, there's two coolers back there along the wall uh, that has ice water for anyone that needs ice water. We don't need anyone getting sick because of the heat. So please help yourself. So I'd like to welcome everyone to our, um, I'm not sure what number reading of the Frederick Douglass speech uh, in several languages. But before we get going, um, Dick and McWhite, can you come up and lead us in prayer? Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your presence, we thank you for your love, and we thank you for this day that you have created for us. Let each voice that is spoken today and each ear that is here to receive that word also hear from you. Let there be something special that stays with each of us that carries us through this entire week. No matter what we hear today, let there be something special that stays with us. Let there be something instructive that will lift us up in the time when we feel low. In your holy name, we thank you for this and so much more. Amen. 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 Thank you, Deacon. Okay. Now I know not to get too close to the mic. So again, welcome to everyone. Um, before I turn this over to our board member, Willie Wilson, I'd like to, uh, as we read this speech, remember the time frame um, it was in. It was 1852. Now, even though Frederick Douglass was giving the speech in Rochester, New York, and as you know, the North was a little bit more tolerant of people of color at that time, okay, uh, he was still courageous enough to, to give the speech because if he was in another state, specifically a southern state, he would be arrested, thrown in jail, or worse. So um, please keep that in mind uh, when, uh, when, as the speech is being read. Uh, that time frame, 1852, remember, was pre-Civil War. Um, Emancipation Proclamation was not even thought of. Abraham Lincoln was an unknown senator from Illinois. So that's the basic history, and I'm sure uh, Willie will talk more about that. So, uh, without further ado, uh, we will get going with this, with this speech. Um, I'd like to introduce our resident historian and board member, Willie Wilson. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. I'm glad to be here. Uh, just a, a reminder in terms of the actual site. As you know, this is the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association, of which John is our president. But this actual site is important because it used to be High Street, but it's now Frederick Douglass Avenue. And one of the reasons why it was changed is because, uh, to my right, was the Edward Eels Bennett uh, house, home, and also barn, which was part of the Underground Railroad. So Frederick Douglass actually spoke here uh, in the not in the early paper, be, uh, which predates the Brockton Enterprise, was the North Bridgewater Gazette, and uh, it covered his speeches. And so he spoke here along with other abolitionists over a period of time. So this site is, is very important. Uh, also, we have Messiah Baptist Church which was established in 1897, the same year as Lincoln Congregational Church, and those were the city's first two black churches. And uh, even though they were established in 1897, some of the people, people of color from the South, notably North Carolina and Virginia, were fellowshipping before the churches were actually officially established. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I also want you to, again, John mentioned 1852, and uh, Frederick Douglass delivered his speech in Rochester, New York, and uh, and basically, it was uh, as we, you're going to hear in the speech, it, it's you know why should we as people of color who are enslaved celebrate the Fourth of July? And I'm so pleased to say that uh, for me as a historian, 
I, I'm, I'm so pleased because of Juneteenth. It, it really is from Juneteenth, June 19th to J uh, July 4th, which is really uh, an American celebration in terms of celebrating everyone who had their freedom. Because when the uh, Declaration of Independence was coined and phrased and came into being, women did not have the right to vote as well as enslaved. So keep all of that in mind as you hear these, it, the speech is fantastic and, and it's written the, it, just remember this also, keep in mind that he had no formal education. He was totally self-educated. So when you listen to the vocabulary words and the power they evoke, uh, please be cognizant of that. So with little further ado, I'll read the first stanza. And as usual, uh, the last stanza will be uh, read by none other than our first man, the mayor of the city of Brockton, uh, Mayor Sullivan. Mr. President, friends, and fellow citizens, the task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way, for it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. And the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. Hi everyone, my name is Anabel Santiago and I'm going to be reading paragraph two in Spanish. Este, para el propósito de esta celebración, es el 4 de julio. Este es el cumpleaños de tu independencia nacional y de tu libertad política. Esto para ti tiene el significado de la Pascua para la gente emancipada de Dios. Lleva a sus mentes al día y al acto de tu gran liberación. También es, esta celebración significa el comienzo de otro año de tu vida nacional. Y te recuerda que la República de América ahora tiene 76 años. Estoy feliz, ciudadanos compañeros, porque tu nación es muy joven. Estás, incluso ahora, solo a la empieza de tu carrera nacional, todavía persistiendo en el periodo de infancia. Repito, me alegro que así sea. Hay esperanza en el pensamiento y la esperanza es muy necesaria. Debajo de las nubes oscuras que se bajan sobre el horizonte. Hello, my name is Cindy Pendergast. I'm reading paragraph three in English. Fellow citizens, the simple story is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people, in which you now glory, was not then born. You were under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government. England as the fatherland, although a considerable distance from your home, impose in the exercise of its parental prerogatives upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations as in mature judgment it deemed wise, right, and proper. Hi folks, John Krasinskis, and I will be reading paragraph number four in Lithuanian, and just as an aside, um, Lithuanian is one of the oldest still spoken languages in the world. It traces its roots back to Sanskrit. Bet you said tavai, kore ne prima mados, shes dienos, 
Ape versibis nescladuma et absoluta yo veco pabutu. Manme cad ye scarce no nama versibis del caito crutu sucumo et te singoma apreboyoma. Ike shore ye jogaset cad esreske netings netisingas nepregristas versibis priamams. Er abscrita tox, cox naturite bute tile patekas. Man bevec nereke pasquite cat pelece, cat mana nomine aper chas premos, vishiscae atitincae usutevo nomine. Tox suticimus mana nomine. And I have a baby. <laughs> I have a baby uh, praying mantis. <laughs> okay. Tox suticimus mano nodimus ne cap ne butu vertis. Tai ne biotoma erodire cat coque dale galicia paiente ye givinanama pe didele. Ginsha. The bar sacadimus. Cut America, ir te singa ma. Ir Anglia, ne te singa. Ir labai lengva. Visi galia tai pasakite da start ne major kaip kilnus drashus. Gali ne tinkite as ritu Anglias, terio ma ir Americas colonias. Tai ir madinga tai padarite bet musu laika sky. Passes a cant pre Anglia, er colonia, prejudices labu bandu viruselis. Te cura tai dare sabadena ujraste piscagrima, passes tubo er sukilemo pavoinga viru. Idashne pres net net a single silpness. Pres de prepsis o pres paldos pres pres palda chas slipe no pelene atas coris is visus kito at atrodo musu de de noia atrodo ne protegas laisvas pres prejastis galas sumushte jumones coris slovena yusu tevo darbose. Bet, Norarma Teste. Hi there. My name is Lee Bigger, and I'll be reading paragraph five in English. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling idea, much more so than we, at this distance of time, regard it. The timid and the prudent of that day were, of course, shocked and alarmed by it. Their opposition to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful, but amid all their terror and affrighted phosphorations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on and the country with it. Good afternoon on this warm summer. My name is Cheryl Royster and I'm a proud member of Messiah Baptist Church. And I also want to give honor to God that I'm able to do this. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshipers of poverty, clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of the national sanction. They did so in the form of a resolution. We seldom hit upon resolutions. 
growing up in our day whose transparency is at all equal. It resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free independent states. That they are absolved from all alliance of the British Crown. I am Richard Reed and I'll be reading in English the seventh paragraph. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded, and today you reap the fruit of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you, therefore, may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history, the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. I'm Lynn Reed. I'll be reading in English, paragraph 8. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. Hello, my name is Sofia Simmons, and I'm going to be reading paragraph 9 in Portuguese. Eles amavam seu país mais do que seus próprios interesses particulares e todos irão admitir que é uma virtude rara que deve impor respeito. Aquele que, inteligentemente, dar a sua vida para seu país é um homem que não é da natureza humana desprezar. Seus pais apostaram suas vidas, suas fortunas e suas honras sagradas pela causa de seu país. Hi, my name is Debbie Candora and I'll be reading uh, paragraph number 10 in English. They were peacemen, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They showed forbearance, but they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery, slavery and oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. They were great in their day and generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. Um, Michelle Dubois, state representative here in Brockton. I'm happy to participate uh, today. We said 11 and 12, right? How circumspect, exact, and proportionate were all their movements. How unlike the politicians of an hour, their statesmanship looked beyond the passing moment and stretched away in strength into the distant future, fully appreciating the hardship to be encountered, firmly believing in the right of their cause, wisely measuring the terrible odds against them. Your fathers, the fathers of this republic, laid the cornerstone of the national superstructure which has risen and still rises in grandeur around you. Of this fundamental work, this day is the anniversary. My business, if I have here any today, is with the present, the accepted time with God, and His cause is the ever-living now. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. Now is the time, the important time. Your fathers have lived, died, and have done their work, and have done much of it well. You've lived and must die, and you must do your work. You have no right to enjoy a child's share in the labor of your fathers unless your children are to be blessed by your labors you have no right to wear out and waste the hard-earned fame of your fathers to cover your indolence miles jackson i'll be reading paragraph 13. fellow citizens pardon me allow me to ask why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those represent or those that I represent to do 
with your national independence are the great principles of political freedom and the natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? Am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us. I'm Kathy Nye. I will be reading paragraphs 14 and 15 in American Sign Language, so there will be no sound. So if you want to look at it, but there will be nothing verbalized. Susan Thomasy, and I'll be reading paragraphs 16 and 17 in English. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to joy you, join you in joyous anthems were inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy, and grievous yesterday are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reached them. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I see this day from the slave's point of view. Standing here, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charlie Hopwood, and I will be reading paragraph number 18 in English. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can command. Everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command. And yet, not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice, or who is not a heart slaveholder, shall not confess to be right and just. Hi, I'm Carol Griffin. I will be reading paragraph 19 in English. I fancy I hear some of my audience say, it is not just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? 
would you persuade more and rebuke less, your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But, I submit, where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? Hello, I'm Patrick Quinn, and I'll be reading paragraphs 20 and 21 in English. Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactments of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia which, if committed by a black man, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teachings of the slave to read or write. When you, when you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in the streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on, the on your hills, when the fish of the sea, and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then will I argue with you that the slave is a man. Hello, I'm Susan Nicastro, and this is paragraph 22 in English. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, have among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God, and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. And this is paragraph 23, also in English. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a manner beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice, hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans to show that men have a natural right to freedom. To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of, earth, of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. Good afternoon, my name is Charlene Lee. I will be reading paragraph 24 in English. What am I to argue that it is written to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with lash, to load their limbs with iron, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auctions, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them without obedience and submission to their masters, must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have been employment of my time and strength than such argument would imply. Hi, I'm Nancy Martin, and I'll read paragraph number 25 in French. Que reste-t-il donc à argumenter? Que l'esclavage n'est pas divin? Que Dieu ne l'a pas établi? Que nos docteurs en divinité se soient trompés. L'idée même relève du blasphème. Que ce qui est inhumain ne serait très divin. Qui peut argumenter sur une proposition? Je ne peux pas. Le temps pour cela, cela est révolu.
at a time like this, scorching ir irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability, and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting repro reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypo hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. Kathy Nye, paragraph 27 in American Sign Language. Good afternoon, I'm Mark Osborne, and I'll be reading paragraph 28 in French and 29 in English. Il n'y a pas une nation sur terre coupable de pratiques plus choquantes et sanglantes que le peuple de ces États-Unis à cette heure même. Allez où vous voulez, cherchez où vous pouvez, parcourez toutes les monarchies, les despotismes de l'ancien monde, recherchez tous les abus, et quand vous avez trouvé le dernier, mettez vos fêtes à côté des pratiques quotidiennes de cette nation, et vous direz avec moi, que pour une barbarie révoltante et une hypocrisie éhontée, l'Amérique règne sans rival. Take the American slave trade, which is especially prosperous just now, and carry it on in all the large towns and cities in one half of this confederacy. In several states, this trade is a chief source of wealth. It is called the internal slave trade. In order to divert from it, the horror with which the foreign slave trade is contemplated. That trade has long been denounced by this government as an execrable traffic. To arrest it, this nation keeps a squadron at immense cost on the coast of Africa. Everywhere in this country, it is safe to speak of this foreign slave trade as a most inhuman traffic opposed alike to the law of God and man. It is, however, a notable fact that while so much execration is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade, the men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation and their business is deemed honorable. Hi, I'm Jamie Hodges and I'll be reading paragraph number 30. Behold the practical operations of this internal slave trade. The American slave trade sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you will see men, men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what a swine drover? Do you know what it is, a swine drover? I will show you a man drover. They inhabit all our southern states. They permeate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. You will see one of the human flesh drovers armed with pistols, whip and bow knives, driving a company of 100 men, women and children from the Potomac to the slave market at New Orleans. These wrenched people are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. 
They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. Hi, I'm Steve Thompson. I'm going to read 31, 32, and 33 in English. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along, and the inhuman wretch who drives them. Hear his savage yells and his blood-curdling oaths as he hurries on his affrighted captives. There see the old man with locks thinned and gray. Cast one glance, if you please, upon that young mother whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun, her briny tears falling on the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, that girl of thirteen, weeping, yes, weeping, as she thinks of her mother from whom she has been torn. The drove moves tardily. Heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strength. Suddenly you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank and the chain rattles simultaneously. Your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way to the center of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of a slave whip. The scream you heard was from a woman you saw with the babe. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child and her chains. That gash on her shoulder tells her to move on. Follow the drove to New Orleans. Attend the auction. See men examine like horses. See forms of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this drove sold and separated together and never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from that scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun can you witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? Yet this is but a glance at the American slave trade as it exists at this moment in the United States. Fellow citizen, this murderous traffic is today in active operation in this boasted republic. In the solitude of my spirit, I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the South. I see bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to slave markets, where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep, and swine, knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest ties broken ruthlessly to satisfy the lust, the caprice, and rapacity of the buyers and sellers of men. Hello, I'm Rita Mendes, and I'm going to read uh, paragraph 34 in uh, Portuguese. Por um ato do Congresso dos Estados Unidos, com menos de dois anos, a escravidão foi nacionalizada em sua forma mais horrível e revoltante. A linha Mason e Dixon foi obliterada. Nova York tornou-se Virgínia, e o poder de manter, caçar e vender homens, mulheres e crianças como escravos não é mais uma mera instituição estadual, mas agora é uma instituição de todos os Estados Unidos. And I'm also going to read a uh, paragraph 35 in Spanish. É o poder é coextensivo com o Star Spangled Banner e o cristianismo estadunidense donde quiera que vayan también puede ir el despiadado cazador de esclavos donde están el hombre no es sagrado es un pássaro para el arma del deportista por este más sucio y diabólico de todos los decretos humanos la libertad y persona de cada hombre está en peligro Su amplio dominio republicano es terreno de hombres. Ah, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Engel. I'll be reading paragraph 36 in English. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president, your secretary of state, in force as a duty you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. Not fewer than 40 Americans have, within the past two years, been hunted down and, without a moment's warning, hurried away in chains and consigned to slavery and excruciating torture. Some of these have had wives and children dependent on them for bread, but of this no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior 
to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. My name is Christopher McWhite and I will be reading paragraph 37 in English. For black men, there is neither law nor justice, humanity nor religion. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judge who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery and five when he fails to do so. The oath of any two villains is sufficient under this hell black en enactment to send the most pious and exemplary black man into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His testimony is nothing. He can bring no witness for himself. The minister of American justice is bound to the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetually told. Let it be thundered around the world that in tyrant killing, king hating, people-loving, democratic, Christian America. The seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palpable bribe and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty to hear only his accusers. My name is Aiza. I'm going to read, I'm going to read 38 in English. In glaring violation of justice, in shameless disregard of the forms of administrating law, in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenses, and in the diabolical intent, this fugitive slave's law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. Hello. Um. Hello, my name is Nicholas, and I'm reading page 39. I mean, paragraph 39. <coughs> Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three millions of your countrymen. You hurl your anathemas at the crown-headed tyrants of Russia and Austria and pride yourselves on your democratic institutions, while you yourselves consent to be the mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppression from abroad, honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, Cheer them, toast them, salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives from your own land, you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. John, are you saying I'm not young? Hi, folks. Mark Lindy. You discourse eloquently on the dignity of labor, yet you sustain a system which in its very essence casts a stigma upon labor. You can bear your bosom to the storm of British art artillery to throw off a three-penny tax on tea and yet wring the last hard-earned farthing from the grasp of the black laborers of your country. You profess to believe that, one of blood, God made all nations of men to dwell on the face of all the earth and hath commanded all men everywhere to love one another. Yet you notoriously hate and glory in your hatred, all men whose skins are not colored like your own. Good afternoon. My name is Margaret Jean Howard, and I will be reading paragraph 41 and 42 in English. You declare before the world, and are understood by the world to declare, that you hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet, you hold securely 
in a bondage which, according to your own Thomas Jefferson, is worse than ages of that which your fathers rose in rebellion to oppose a seventh part of our inhabitants of your country. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as a base of pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. Be warned. A horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster, and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy, crush and destroy forever. I'm Phyllis Ellis. I will be reading paragraph 43 in English. Allow me to say, in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark pictures I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. I, therefore, leave off where I began, with hope, while drawing encouragement from a declaration of independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Robert Sullivan. I'm reading in English uh, the last number 44 paragraph, and then all of us will be doing the closing stanza. This time when such could be done, but a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arms of commerce have borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. Wind, steam, and lightning are its charted agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are now distinctly heard on the other. In the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say and let every heart join in saying it, God speed the day when human blood shall cease to flow and every clime be understood that claims of human brotherhood in each return for evil good not blow for blow. That day will come all feuds to end, and change is a faithful friend, each foe. I want to, uh, I want to first of all um, thank John and, and Shirley and Willie and everybody that, that puts a lot of time into this. But before I, I say some things, we are missing someone, uh, a real champion that passes here, Joni Madden. Joan Madden loved coming here every year. She was always dressed to the nines with a beautiful hat on, and I remember the last time we were here with a young child, it was Joan that was here comforting that, that young girl. So let's always remember Joan and her family, uh, and she will never be forgotten here in the city of Brockton, ever. So I want to thank a lot of people yesterday, and I know I'll miss some people, but I know Mrs. Linda Picciatonio and Kelly Hanlon and Willie Wilson and so many others, Cindy Pentergast, came here and cleaned here. They also went down the street and cleaned the Liberty Tree. I want to thank them. This isn't a one-off. They do this on a regular basis. And then they text me and they say, Mayor, can you pick up the bags and DPW comes. So I want to thank everybody that considers this a special place because it is a special place. I want to thank BCA and Thomas for being here on a Sunday. And think about it. It's a Sunday, a beautiful day in June. You could be anywhere. Anywhere you want to be, but this is where you choose to be because this is Brockton. When you look out here, it's a reflection of the city of champions. Different faces, different ages, different orientations, 
That's the Brockton I know. That's the Brockton I love. And each and every one of you love the city of Brockton. We can only do better together. So as mayor, one thing that I can tell you is we're working ag actively right now. My chief of staff is Mrs. Sidney Merrill. I know Phyllis Ellis from the president of the NAACP and, and Willie Wilson. I know Jackie Jones, Attorney Jones, and Gwen Knowles. We're working on, on a black history trail here in the city of Brockton. Long overdue. Yeah. It's going to come to fruition. The other thing that I wanted to just share with you is that the Liberty Tree down the street, which is true history, not just Brockton history, it's American history, it's not owned by the city of Brockton, it's owned privately. As soon as I found that out, we've been actively working to acquire that. We will acquire that. That will be an asset of the city of Brockton. We'll be able to beautify it. We're going to be able to expand it. And I also want to thank State Rep. Jerry Cassidy. Rep. Cassidy asked me, Mayor, is there any, any earmarks that you're thinking about this year? I said, Jerry, you hit a home run with a statue for Marvelous Marvin Hagler. $150,000. It's going on on, on, on uh, Petronelli Way. And I said, is there any way you could come up with some money for a Frederick Douglass statue? You know what he did? $75,000 has been earmarked in the city of Brockton. So we are going to be able to have a fitting tribute to Mr. Douglass right down the street there. So again, we're all in this together. COVID changed everything, right? Physically, financially, emotionally, mentally, everything. But days like this is what it means to be a Brocktonian. So again, John, you and Sherry Lee should be applauded. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just want to say that it is an honor and privilege to be mayor. I want to thank all my fellow elected officials that are here today, all the residents, all the business owners. This is awesome. So God bless each and every one of you. And thank you, thank you, thank you. So to conclude our program, um, why don't we uh, why don't we end it with a uh, with a short reflection, a short prayer? I think that would be appropriate. Um, do we have Deacon McWhite here again? Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving each of us a voice. But Lord, thank you for giving our brother fallen Frederick Douglass a voice, a voice that we still hear to this very day a voice that still calls out to us from the annals of history. It has been said that the, the arc of history bends towards justice. And Lord, let us live out those words of justice that were spoken by that theologian and also by that freedom fighter, Frederick Douglass. Let each of us carry the mantle with us wherever we go and remember that until freedom is everywhere, freedom is nowhere. And now Lord, as we separate from this place, let us never be separated from your presence. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you to all the elected officials. Thank you for the uh, presidents of the organization. And enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you.